You're listening to Market Champions, a podcast on navigating the financial markets. Here's your host, Shabas Prakash. This episode of Market Champions is brought to you by Simplify ETFs. For more information, visit simplify.us. No Simplify funds will be discussed during this podcast. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Market Champions. I just wanted to remind you to like, subscribe, and leave a comment. Really helps the page grow, really helps the podcast grow. Thank you so much for your support. And now on to the interview. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Market Champions. Today we've got Jean Champaglia. He's the CEO and Senior Magic Director at Sprout Asset Management. John, thank you so much for being on the podcast. It's wonderful to have you back. Nice to be back. Thank you for having me. Awesome. So, you know, one thing that, you know, we were discussing at the start, just off the record that sort of piqued my interest was, you know, you said that, and, you know, what we've seen over the last few months, over the last six-ish months is, you know, markets have increasingly just traded based off of what the Fed is doing, um, based off of interest rate hikes and so on. And, you know, you sort of commented that, um, you know, we might soon start seeing markets, you know, stop caring as much about interest rates. So could you talk a little bit about that and, you know, how, um, and, you know, why you think so? Yeah, well, I guess we were, we were joking. I was fed up with the Fed um, <laughs> because, uh, you know, since basically the spring, it's, it's all, it's all that's really driving a lot of the action. Um, and, uh, unfortunately, that that has led to you know a, a very significant backup in interest rates and bond yields, which has really drained the market of liquidity. Um, and and as the liquidity has dried up, things have become more volatile, especially as you get into the smaller cap uh, segments of the marketplace. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's a bit frustrating when you've got uh, something like interest rates really kind of hijacking the whole narrative. Um, from other sectors that, you know, like uranium, which have a lot of really interesting and positive developments underpinning their fundamentals. So, um, you know, we we talk to uranium investors all the time. They remain very bullish on the thesis, uh, but they acknowledge that the market is kind of in a a holding pattern uh, because there's just not a a lot of risk capital being put into the market these days. People are sitting on the sidelines um, the good news is at some point they're going to stop raising interest rates because if they don't, you're going to have a lot of things start to break. And I, and I think uh, if you look down at Main Street and look at some of the things that are happening right now, particularly in the housing market, which has been a huge engine of economic growth since the last financial crisis, you're starting to see a complete stall. And that does not bode well for the economy because it has such positive ripple effects across uh, many different sectors. So uh-huh. we think we're, we're getting towards the end of this tightening cycle. I think you're starting to see little signs or flinches by some of these central banks that um, they've, they've kind of pushed hard here and they need to, I think, take a, a wait and see approach now to see exactly, you know, the lag effect of these rate, rate hikes, how it's going to trickle through down to Main Street. No, oh, absolutely. And, you know, for, uh, you know, for people like us based in Toronto, just Canada as a whole, I was reading that um, housing affordability was down to its lowest in 41 years. And, you know, as you described, you know, Main Street, you know, that's that that is that, that is absolutely nuts. And, you know, it's sort of this, uh, it's sort of a similar situation in the U.S. as well. So it's been one of the things that's been very interesting to watch. Um, you know, moving on to, you know, sort of the topic that the the, the, the topic that, you know, we were supposed to discuss, which is uranium. Um so I wanted to, you know, wanted to kick it off by, uh, you know, just talking a bit about the Sprott Uranium Trust itself. So, you know, one of the things that, you know, we were discussing last time and, you know, I wanted to bring up again was, you know, sort of Sprott is in a way different because it's a physical uranium trust. And the last time, you know, you were on the podcast, we sort of dis- discussed how um, the spot market for uranium is quite opaque. It's not really, you know, very clear um, and not necessarily always very liquid. So, you know, when it comes to the day-to-day running of the ETF, you know, what are the challenges that you face and, you know, how, and how do you sort of overcome those challenges, especially as they relate to say liquidity, uh, you know, not knowing, you know, who's really selling, who's buying and uh, et cetera. 
Yeah, sure. Well, look, a lot of our activity is uh, is very consistent, meaning that, you know, irrespective of what's going on in the macro markets, we keep doing what we do all the time, which is keep telling our story, keep educating the marketplace um, as to why nuclear energy is part of the solution to not only energy transition and decarbonization of uh, global economies, but uh, more recently, it really highlights the benefits related to energy security. And I've been really focusing on this thematic because I don't think the average investor really understands where energy comes from, how it's produced, um, and, and the different supply chains related to energy production. And I mean, I just had a call with, with our sales team in Europe to really uh, hit home this point around how uh, two different forms of energy production can behave so differently from one, from one another. And I'll just give you an example of what I share with them. If you think about the price of natural gas, I mean, there have been multiple periods over the last couple of years where the price has gone up four, five, six, seven, eight hundred percent in these price spikes. And the reality is, is that, you know, that particular commodity is very susceptible to supply shocks uh, because it is not easy to store. You can store a finite amount of it. And when it's not available, um, you, you then have the marginal buyer willing to push the price up to very extreme levels. And you saw that all summer in Europe where the price of natural gas got to astronomical levels as they were all basically trying to accumulate gas for the, for the winter. If you think about um, you know, running a natural gas power plant, you are susceptible to not just the price shock, but you're also susceptible to the uh, potential supply shock. Meaning every day I have, to, I have to find the fuel to pump into my plant to burn to spin turbines. Mm -hmm. If you if you contrast what happens at a nuclear power plant, it's the polar opposite. Meaning you basically load your fuel into the reactor core and it runs pretty much nonstop for 18 months. It's the complete opposite. You don't have any supply shock vulnerability and you don't have any price shock vulnerability because it's basically load and go. Um, you don't have to find your source uh, of energy on a daily basis to, to, to put into your power plant. And I think what's happened in Europe has really highlighted for a number of countries in Europe, this over-reliance that they've had on cheap natural gas from Russia over the years, as well as um, overbuilding uh, heavily in renewables, which unfortunately have intermittency. And when you're not producing renewable energy, you basically only have three options to offset that intermittency. You can basically burn coal, which they're doing in Germany mm -hmm. at record levels. You can burn that gas or you can have a nuclear power plant. Um, there's no other alternative. And so if you can't get gas or the gas is too expensive and you don't want to burn coal because it's the dirtiest form of energy production, nuclear is like the natural solution. It, it ticks the box for energy security and it ticks the box for zero greenhouse gas. So these politicians who have been reluctant to support nuclear energy over the last 10 years are all of a sudden doing about face U-turns because they don't have any other card to play here. And so you're seeing governments around the world uh, support their nuclear energy, whether it's announcing life extensions, uh, restarts, uh, different incentives, whether those are tax or financial incentives to allow their, their utilities to compete more effectively um, with, with renewables, which have historically received massive amounts of subsidization, tax, you know, tax credits, fixed contracts, carbon credits, you name it. Um, there's been massive incentives. The nuclear industry has not received those incentives for the last 10 years. And I think the Inflation Reduction Act in the United States, uh, which recently was announced, is a really good proof point how the how the wind has shifted in favor of nuclear. Because that particular piece of legislation has very meaningful support features for nuclear energy in the United States, which will allow utility operators to make long-term 
uh, capital X, uh, CapEx decisions and uh, uranium buying decisions with confidence, knowing that their plants are going to be able to operate profitably, their plants are going to be able to get life extensions, et cetera. So I think it's um, it's it's just been an absolute game changer uh, in terms of the policy shifts that we've seen this year. Got it. Yeah. And, you know, the whole um, Inflation Reduction Act, it was very interesting because I think that also attests to, to the political shift in uranium that you highlighted. Um, you know, one of the prop one of the um, propositions in the IRA was to to uh, to sort of secure HA LEU funding in the U.S., which I think was very interesting. And you know, there's the specific stocks like uh, this, uh, there's a uh, Centrus Energy in the U.S., which stands to benefit from that very strongly. So I think that's I, th I think that's um, uh, I think that's that sounds about right. And you know, in terms of what we're seeing in Europe, um, you know what. No, what you know? How soon do you think you know uh, countries like Germany, you know France, uh, the UK, uh, actually make that shift back towards uranium? Because you know Germany has sort of become sort of nef uh, notorious for uh, for shutting down its uranium plants and boosting uh, its reliance on coal and natural gas, primarily supplied by Russia. So you know, uh, how soon do you think you know Europe also makes that shift? Yeah, well, I think it's 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 happening right now. I mean, you. You've seen the Bel the Belgians uh, announce life extensions uh, 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 after um, uh, working through or planning to do phase out. So that is a pretty meaningful uh, U turn. Uh, the UK clearly wants to add more nuclear energy in its mix. Uh, France wants to do uh, wants to build more nuclear power plants, and you know France is having challenges with some of its reactors right now. Um, Poland uh, is another great example, very heavily dependent on coal to produce electricity. They just signed a couple of uh, MOUs with different nuclear power plant uh, firms to build, uh, I believe it's up to six reactors over the coming, coming years, which, which is a great sign of a country, you know, in 2022 announcing for the very first time, they're going to adopt this technology to deal with decarbonization goals as well as energy trend, uh, security goals. So I think that's a, a really a good example for sure. Um, it's happening. You know, the EU is adding it into its sustainable finance taxonomy January 1st, finally. Uh, the UK is working on the same thing. And, you know, you know, well, let's just finish up. Let's just finish off with the poster child for dysfunctional energy policy, Germany. Um, I had another chuckle the other day about uh, a recent vote they did to extend the operating life of their uh, last three reactors that were supposed to supposed to be closing in December of this year, and as you know, they've been uh, they've been granted a reprieve to operate till April. And I found it amazing that uh, over two hundred people in their in their lower par parliament uh, actually voted against that decision, and seventy people abstained from it. Can you believe that? Um, maybe we should turn their power off if there's a blackout. We'll turn their power off first. Um, so it is quite crazy in terms of, of some of this energy policy, how it's uh, how it's been um, impacted by certain groups that just I just don't think they understand the energy mix uh, and, you know, in terms of reliable base load power and affordable power. Um, you know, let's not forget that. Yep. And, and sort of the implications, because, you know, one, we've got the forthcoming winter. Um, and so the, the projections for Europe at least seem to be bleak. You know, countries like Italy, uh, the base case is that they they likely run out of energy unless, you know, a lot of the uh, unless a lot of the people are willing to face sort of a cold, harsh winter. And, you know, if it, if it is a bad winter, you know, it's not going to be good for Europe at all. So it, it, it is crazy how, you know, politicians are still busy playing games um, when, sort of, when sort of something as fundamental as energy policy is on the line. Yeah, I mean, look, I think everyone's hoping they have a mild winter and they have enough gas to get through. Um, you know, they're they're obviously hoping they have a mild winter and and hoping that with certain conservation steps, um, they'll be able to skate through. But it, you know, it maybe gets you through this winter, but what about thereafter? Um, you know, it's it uh, it hasn't been lost on 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 uh, many people in the world that. The increase in LNG prices this year, uh, mainly because countries in Europe have been bidding up the prices so they can fill up their reservoirs 
has had a very material adverse effect on many poor countries in the world who do not have the financial means to pay for natural gas at 80 or 90 you know million BTU. Um, and so you know this does have impacts on uh, different countries in the developing world, social unrest, government stability. So this is a big, big global issue. And that's why I think if you have a source of energy generation that can provide reliable base load power um, like nuclear, I don't understand why politicians, some, are still advocating to close down these power plants that are perfectly in good working condition. Yep, 100%. And, you know, just on that note, so, you know, we were talking about how um, uh, uh, a lot of these uh, a lot of these power plants were being shut down by politicians. You know, when it comes to the price of uranium, you know, how high you know, can uranium go, you know, before supply comes back and, you know, before, you know, companies actually start to wake up, you know, boosting CapEx, boosting the number of reactors, you know, mining operations, et cetera. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, a year and a bit ago, the price was in the high 20s per pound. Now we're in the low 50s per pound. We did touch about $63 in the spring, um, the price has moved. You know, the average price of uranium in 2022 is over 40% higher than the average price of uranium in 2021. So we've seen a price response. We've seen a uh, response from the utilities, which have come back into the market and are contracting to buy more uranium on long-term contracts the highest amounts we've seen in many, many years. If you just look at Cameco, for example, you know, they've contracted 77 million pounds so far this calendar year. Last year, they contracted 30 million for the whole year. Yep. So they're more than double last year's pace, which is a great sign. Why? Well, because utilities are looking at the signals, they're getting the support from government, they're getting the incentives, and they're running down their inventory. So they need to come back to the market and they need to buy on long-term uh, long contracts. So we're seeing that. Now, there has also been a supply response, meaning that if the demand is coming from the utilities, the tier one assets and some of the tier two assets, which have been on care and maintenance for four to five years now, are finally coming back online, which is really positive because, you know, as a mining company, I don't think people appreciate how much it costs to keep an asset on care and maintenance. Um, and when you can basically turn that liability um, around, you know, from a, 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 you know, a minus on your on your income statement to a plus when you get back to production, it can have a huge impact on these companies, which is why investors are interested in uranium stocks again, because as these mines get restarted, um, they they go from essentially cost liabilities to basically cash flow um, machines again. So you're starting to see the existing operations on care and maintenance come back online. That's that's the obvious first supply response. Um, and then, you know, you're going to see the next wave of supply response, which are going to be, let's call them tier two assets. These are higher, maybe they're in higher cost jurisdictions or lower grade assets. I expect to see a bunch of those come back online in the United States because, you know, we haven't seen any concrete announcements out of the U.S. yet about restarts. And I always I always like to highlight this fact is, is that the United States has the largest fleet of nuclear reactors in the world. They need 50 million pounds a year to operate of uranium. Mm -hmm. The United States last year produced 21,000 pounds. That's it. Um, so the United States is completely dependent on other nations. Now, thankfully, Canada is a big part of that. But you know, there are friendly nations that are, are part of that supply chain for, for the U.S., but the U.S. has no local uh, uranium production in, in operation right now. Will it next year? No doubt it will, but there's a big gap between, you know, 50 million pounds and 21,000 pounds. And I think governments around the world are starting to, to you know, acknowledge that they need to reshore and, and, and stimulate local supply chains and production and, and processing and manufacturing. You're seeing it happening in battery metals um, and, you know, gigafactories and raw materials related for EVs. Mm -hmm. um, you're seeing governments become much more active about we need to have local supply chains to be able to supply 
raw materials to our gigafactories. We're not going to rely on, on nations which may give us those raw materials and 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 uh, and and manufacturing capabilities today, but maybe we can't rely on them long term. Yeah. And and then our energy transition or our energy security could be in jeopardy. I I, I think it's very encouraging that many governments around the world are starting to acknowledge some of the vulnerabilities with the supply chains that we've offshored. Yep. And I think, um, and I think that's a very interesting point because, you know, we're starting to see that just not with, uh, not, not only with energy policy, but with, uh, with just broadly sort of reshoring, um, you know, bringing back supply chains after see, after seeing the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic. So I think, so I think one that's very, um, very interesting, but two, you know, the other thing, um, the, the other thing with that is, um, this idea of reshoring, considering that countries like Russia, Kazakhstan, which may or may not be friendly neighbors, and Russia obviously not. Um, now what does the ability of the West look like to replace, you know, Russian source uranium? Yeah, it's a good question. So, you know, uranium is a critical a critical element that produces ten percent of the of the world's electricity, and obviously, in places like the United States, it's twenty percent. Where you and I live in, a, in the province of Ontario. 60% 60 per, 60 of our electricity comes from nuclear energy. So it's it's incredibly important. Um, the reality is, is that 70% of uranium production globally comes from either state-owned or state-controlled entities, which happen to be uh, uh, comprised Kazakhstan, Russia, mm -hmm. China, and Uzbekistan. So in terms of, you know, let's call it the former Soviet bloc and China combined, they control most of the world's uranium production. So that's your primary production. If you move along the fuel cycle, um, Russia controls a lot of the conversion capacity as well as, as the enrichment capacity. And those are critical steps in the fuel cycle. And those are in the high kind of high 20% and the high 30% range, respectively. Those are the parts of the, of the fuel cycle that I think the Western utilities and governments are most concerned about. In terms of primary production of uranium, uh, Russia is not a big player. Most of their production actually comes from Kazakhstan through JVs. Um, so it's the services side that, that has people concerned. And so what is happening is that we need to basically reshore those services, as you said, um, back to Canada and the United States and France, where all of our big facilities are. And it will be a, a multi-year process. This is not going to happen overnight. Uh, some of these facilities have been uh, either closed for the last five years and are in the process of restarting, or they've been operating at a, at a fraction of their total capacity. And mm -hmm. so it's going to take time to make investments to get these plants back online and to expand their capacity so that there can be essentially an orderly transition or weaning off of these Russian services. And that's exactly why there are no sanctions against any elements of, nu of the nuclear fuel cycle against Russia today. The reason is well, there is no alternative readily available today to basically migrate away from some of these services that Russia's historically provided. And that obviously you know, represents a conundrum to different governments as well as the different utilities. Um, they're clearly not signing new contracts with Russian entities, but they're, they're absolutely um, taking delivery under previously signed agreements. And if you look at what the Department of Energy in the United States is doing, you know, they've asked Congress for $4 billion of funding to basically help facilitate that transition for their, uh, for their reactors. So this is something that I would say is the, is the next big challenge over the next one to say five years in terms of this reshoring process. Um, I think it's gonna happen. I don't think uh, even if things were to change tomorrow in Ukraine, that uh, people are gonna be comfortable with that particular supply chain going forward, and uh, I think I think everything is in motion to to reshore uh, those elements of, of of the cycle. Got it. Got it. Yeah. No. One hundred percent. That makes a lot of sense.
And, you know, one of the things, uh, you know, one of the things that sort of existed, especially in the post-pandemic era, was this heavy focus on ESG and ESG investing. And, you know, this sort of consisted broadly of, say, EV companies, um, cobalt producers, lithium battery companies, et cetera. And, you know, the, and, you know um, one thing that we have seen over the last, uh, especially, um, say, since mid-2021, has been that a lot of these ESG stocks have died down. And to some extent, the ESG narrative as a whole has died down. And, you know, primarily this was because, um, you know, so, uh, super capital intensive companies were trading at ridiculous valuations. So they've sort of come back down to earth. One thing that's interesting is, you know, how, you know, how much has the ESG narrative actually helped or hindered uranium? And, you know, one of the fascinating things about uh, this ESG narrative is that, say, companies... Uh, that that are involved in say cobalt and using cobalt in order to uh, in order to produce uh, catalytic converters or batteries or whatever, um, you know those still fall under the ESG narrative even though you know a large part of cobalt is mined in uh, the DRC. I think over half the global um, cobalt supply comes from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which is not very ESG. So from a uranium mm-hmm. standpoint, you know how much has the ESG narrative actually helped or hindered? Um, uranium considering that you know it actually satisfies most of the it, it actually satisfies almost all ESG characteristics I actually think that the way some of the ESG suppliers and methodologies operate have hindered the adoption of nuclear energy and uranium in different institutional portfolios I'm going to focus on institutions because I think that's that's um, the segment of investors that have been leading the charge in terms of this migration to ESG over the last few years. And I know that for a fact, because we we have uh, spoken to a number of, of institutional managers and, and, and investors, uh, predominantly in Europe that say, look, this is a really interesting investment thesis, but you know, it's not part of the EU sustainable finance taxonomy yet. And, and until it does, I, I'm gonna be penalized if I put this in my portfolio. We have seen um, different ESG uh, ratings agencies absolutely just screen out anything to do with uranium and nuclear, which is an incredibly myopic approach because I don't think they have done their homework on the sector and they just simply fixate on, well, it's dangerous or it's not safe or what about the spent fuel? That's that's not good, right? I, I think people need to do their homework and understand the facts. Um, and once they do, I think they will have a very different perspective on not just not just your you know uranium and its role in nuclear energy but all forms of energy come with pros and cons uh through the life through their life cycle and through their supply chains and it's not just a simple black and white issue um i can tell you i've done a lot of work on esg ratings methodologies uh particularly as it pertains to mining and other extractive industries what you basically find is that any extractive industry or resource related industry just naturally gets a negative score or a poor relative score and things like technology companies almost get a free pass because of the nature of their business so again esg is about about sustainability esg is a framework to assess the risks that a business face faces with respect to each of these parameters and how it basically mitigates these risks. That's what it is. It's not a black and white, good or bad. Uh, we need we need lots of critical minerals to enable everything we do in our lives uh, to produce energy so we can have the standard of lifestyle that we all enjoy. Mm-hmm. And I think it's very, very short-sighted to just simply say, all of these companies that happen to operate in these industries are all bad. That That's just not the case at all. We talk to companies, mining companies, that are absolutely world class in their in their respective categories in terms of how they approach ESG related risks. There are real risks and there are heightened risks when you're talking about any extractive industry. Environmental issues are very sensitive. Social licenses are absolutely critical. And as a mining company, if you want to be in business long term and have high rates of return, you're absolutely going to focus on ESG related risks. If you don't, you're going to be out of business real quick. Yep, one hundred percent. And I think you know, on that note, you know, I'm a student at UFT, and you know, one of the things that um, I think was the UFT's endowment, um, they do what they did was they divested out of all um, ONG companies, and you know, I thought that was, uh, I I found that to be incredibly stupid because one, 
um, it's it's sort of one bad investment because you're not uh, one you're not considering um, you know the pros and cons of each energy class you know as you mentioned but also too you know if there's an opportunity in ONG you know you're sort of missing out because you know you've sort of shrunk your mandate to exclude that sector and especially being based in Canada you know ONG is sort of a huge ONG and just in general natural resources is just a huge part of it's just a huge part of Canadian industry overall. So I, I 100% agree. And, you know, is there, do you eventually think that, you know, these ESG rating companies, et cetera, are going to, or, you know, there's going to be some, uh, you know, there's going to be some way they're going to be persuaded into um, believing and seeing the fact that, you know, uranium indeed, one, it satisfies uh, the environmental concerns. It, uh, it's also, you know, produced in good countries like Australia and Canada. And, you know, it's, it's, it's overall, you know, actually pretty good on an ESG scale. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I just I just recently read a, a white paper uh, from the Columbia Columbia Universities. Um, they have a great group there that focuses a lot on energy policy, and they wrote a white paper uh, making the case for why why nuclear energy should, is absolutely an ESG friendly uh, investment theme. And I agree with that. And um, I I think. You know, when you look at the EU, when you look at the UK, South Korea, Canada, they're all including nuclear energy as part of their sustainable finance taxonomies. Um, so this is kind of your stamp of approval, saying, "Hey, this is this is a, an investment area that we we think is is friendly." Um, I think people don't understand the issues related to spent fuel, which is always the the bugaboo issue that I run into around. Well, what about the spent fuel? What about it? You know, it's like, yes, it's responsibly cared for and it's responsibly stored. And yes, the industry does, does need to find long-term solutions around storage. But the reality is we need, we need to deal with long-term storage for every energy type, whether it's retired um, solar panels or retired uh, blades from wind turbines. All of these things have to be dealt with. Uh, once they're finished, their useful lives. So it's 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 not so simple. You know, it's not as simple as it appears. Everything has uh, to be dealt with responsibly and safely. Yep, one hundred percent. I completely agree. Um, you know, going back to this, going back to the Sprott Physical Trust itself. You know, one of the things I'm curious about is considering that um, the trust is focused on holding physical um, uranium. Oh, uh, you know, if there, you know, one, you know, how does the fund handle, you know, typical redemptions? And, you know, as much as we could argue that people who game are stupid, um, you know, how do you handle redemptions? And, you know, if there was sort of a whale exit or, you know, a big exit where, you know, someone would game you know, in a big fashion, you know, what are the, what I say the hedges in place for that? Or, you know, how would that sort of redemption be handled? Well, the, the trust doesn't have a redemption mechanism. So that's, that, that is not a material um, risk. Now, if if there are a lot of investors that want to sell their units, then obviously that can put selling pressure on the trust, and the trust can trade at a discount to its net asset value. So that's the most likely scenario, and we saw that in the summer, not because we saw heavy selling, but we just saw a lack of buyers on the other end, given people were moving to the sidelines and reducing exposure, um, and so you we did see the trust trade at a discount to its NAV over the summer period. And since then, we've seen the trust kind of snap back and get back to NAV and traded a premium. And we've been able to raise more, more capital in the last couple of months and starting to, to grow the pounds in the trust again. So again, the big issue is just around sentiment in the sector. And, and we think that once the sentiment improves and this fixation with the Federal Reserve and inflation and quantitative tightening eases, I think a lot of institutions and retail investors are going to start to deploy the capital back into the market. And we believe that the thesis and the fundamentals underpinning nuclear energy as a form of energy production and uranium, which is the critical fuel, uh, is going to be is going to get its fair share of investment dollars as, as more and people, more and more people understand what's happening. Unfortunately, it took an energy crisis in Europe to really you know, put a, a spotlight on this issue, showing people how vulnerable some of their supply and energy chains are, um, and really highlight to people what the difference is between, you know, vulnerabilities of, uh, let's say, coal or natural gas power plant and nuclear power plants, which have been able to operate continuously without any, any, any disruption.
Mm -hmm. Yep, a hundred percent. And you know, when you know coming back to Ontario, um, you know, you mentioned how Ontario um, is about sixty percent, um, about sixty percent of our electricity comes from you uh, comes from nuclear. Um, you know, just just on that note, you know, do utilities um in Ontario or, or just in general actually care about what goes on in the spot market? Um, I would say somewhat. Um, it's not traditionally how they procure uranium because the quantities that they need and the lead times are generally years out in the future. So one of the beautiful things about the way uh, nuclear power plants operate is they always keep a lot of inventory on hand. And the reason they can do that is because uranium is so energy dense, it's easy to store. If you think about the energy density of coal or the energy density of natural gas, you could imagine an enormous pile of coal would be represented by a very small bundle of nuclear fuel pellets. Or how many, let's call it rail cars of natural gas is equivalent to one fuel bundle in a nuclear power plant. It's astonishing. I think if people actually had a visualization between the equalized energy densities and the and the respective volumes of these of these sources, I think people would be blown right blown blown away. I think you know I'm proud I mean, of, of when I hear that Ontario is often used as a case study uh, amongst different industry, nuclear associations and whatnot, as a part of the world that really got nuclear right. We obviously made big, big investments to refurbish our plants many years ago, and they're working, they're working beautifully. Um, and as a result, we've been able to grow our province and keep energy prices um, very reasonable relative to other parts in the world. I mean, you you probably saw some of the, the horror stories on Twitter with people putting images of their electricity bills from the UK and, and Germany and whatnot this past summer. I mean, it was absolutely scary. Uh, as an individual investor or a small business owner, your, you know, your electricity price goes up eight or, or 10 X. I mean, how do you even survive? So I think Ontario has been a real leader. Um, Yep. Just in the last couple of weeks, the, they announced that uh, they would be making upwards of a billion dollar investment to build a small modular reactor at the Darlington plant. It's going to actually uh, be built right on site of, of the main big reactors, which is great. I mean, Ontario is, is once again kind of leading the pack in terms of SMR development and the government, uh, the provincial and federal government are supporting this. So I think it's pretty exciting. A hundred percent. And, you know, I think there's a, there's a lot to learn um, for, for other governments from the Ontario government. Sense. So, um, so, you know, uh, and, you know, on that, um, on that note, um, in terms of recent corporate activity, you know, one of the things that's made the news was the recent Cameco and, you know, Brookings for new, uh, Brookfield renewable acquisition of Westinghouse, you know, we, we know, so what are your thoughts on that? And, you know, what was sort of your take? Yeah, sure. Um, well, look, I think it's it's a sign of health returning to the industry because I don't think a deal like that would have got done two years ago. There's just no way. Um, Cameco had the confidence to be able to go and raise the capital needed to support that transaction. So I think that's thing one. It's a sign of health returning to the sector and capital returning to the sector. I think for Cameco specifically, it obviously gives them a great opportunity to diversify their business, make it more vertically integrated, make it more global. And I think really try to capitalize on uh, the disruption that's 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 happening right now in Europe uh, with respect to this transition away from, from Russian services. Westinghouse is, I believe, the only company in the world that actually has the ability to provide the nuclear fuel for the Russian design reactors. Uh, and many of them were built around Eastern Europe um, and the former Soviet bloc in the past. So if you're a country in Eastern Europe or Central Europe and you need to uh, transition away from, from Russian fuel, Westinghouse is your, is your option. So um, that's going to give them, I think, new opportunities. Um, so I mean, time will tell in terms of how the, how the transaction plays out, but. You know, I understand the strategic rationale for why they want to diversify their business. Yeah. Um, and I think what's happened in the world this year has kind of provided a provided a unique opportunity for them to capitalize through this transaction. Yep. Yep.
And, and, you know, when it comes to just the uranium trade overall, so, you know, one of the biggest things that, you know, people have been talking about uranium and, you know, you could go back to say 2018, 2019, and then um, in the, uh, you know, in the post-March 2020 uh, period, that they've been talking for a long time about uranium. And, you know, a lot of people that I've spoken to, you know, ad admitted that, you know, they were essentially way too early in investing. And so just on that note, you know, if you had to think about this and say baseball game innings, you know, what inning would you say we're in when it comes to sort of the long uranium trade? Yeah, interesting, because I got asked that question. 50 times. Well, not 50 times, but I got asked that question about six months ago, I think, more or less. And I said the second inning. Um, and obviously, the world's changed a lot since, the, the, since then. I still think we're in the second inning. But the way my answers change is I don't think it's a nine inning game anymore. I do think that the geopolitical system related to uranium and nuclear energy uh, fuel services has been so disrupted that the game is going to play out more than nine innings now because of the transition we're going to see away from some of the Russian services back to reshoring. That's going to extend the game. Yep. Okay. No, that's fair. So it's sort of, we're still in the second inning, but it's going to be a longer game. Yes. Yep. Got it. You know, moving away from uranium, so, you know, Sprott also offers bullion gold trust among um, among other products. So, you know, one of the things that we have seen is sort of this return of higher inflation. So, you know, most of us were used to, at least, for example, uh, you know, people my age or the millennial generation are mostly used to not seeing, you know, these higher levels of, in, uh, of inflation. And, you know, inflation had pretty much died down for the last 10 years and to an extent led to zombified um, credit and fixed income markets. What we finally see in a sort of this return of inflation, but we've not really seen uh, commodities like gold um, do super well, um, uh, do super well within this inflation environment. So, you know, what do you, you know, what, what is what sort of your take on that? And, you know, do you, do you think, you know, we will finally see sort of gold catch up or do you think mm -hmm. because one of the things that's interesting is if you actually plot the relationship of gold with inflation, it seems to have broken off in the late 1990s. So I, 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 uh, I, I found that interesting, but I just wanted to get your take on it. Yeah, sure. Well, I think um, it's fair to say that gold in U.S. dollar terms has not perform performed well in absolute terms this year. If you look at gold in sterling terms, yen terms, euro terms, Canadian dollar terms, et cetera, et cetera, and I, you don't even have to go to countries like Turkey and the lira or the Argentinian peso or whatever, Gold has performed incredibly well for those countries because it's it's been all about king dollar this year. Uh, so U.S. investors um, holding gold have not fared as well. Um, it yes, gold is down you know single digit percentages. U.S. stocks are down almost twenty percent. So gold's done okay relative to stocks. But when you look at gold in other local currency terms, it's done incredibly well, um, and that's why many people around the world are so interested in gold because their currencies are not very strong. You can imagine someone, if you lived in Turkey and you're, and the lira has just fallen 70%, but your gold has, you know, in, in, in lira terms has gone up 70%. Uh, that's an incredible way to protect your wealth. And, and, and it's, it's why people in the emerging markets in particular tend to have very high affinity for gold. So, our belief is that as King dollar kind of settles down and it's starting to show some signs of getting tired, gold is going to, is, is going to perform better. We've seen gold in the last two weeks really snap out of, out of its funk uh, and start to put on some, some strength here. So I think we, we will see better days ahead for gold as King dollar kind of cools off. Um, but again, you know, I, I think it really is, is mar you have to look at each market and, and, and put it in almost local, local experience terms mm -hmm. gotcha and and you know one more thing one more commodity that i did want to touch up on was oil and you know this might be a really stupid question but i'm curious so you know one you know you've got a lot of experience within um sort of etf construction especially as it relates to commodities so when you look at oil you know the typical etfs that are available for oil that um that, uh, that are sort of close to spot or stuff like uso but if you look at the performance of USO um, relative to say the front month on WTI contract, for example, um, it's not really it's not really kept 
Um, it's not really kept track of it, similar to say GLD and gold or SLV and silver. Um, and you know, to, uh, there are obviously challenges to owning physical oil, um, etc. But uh, you know, one, you know, what it, what would it take to construct um, an oil ETF, you know, or an oil physical a physical oil trust, similar to you know the way GLD has been constructed for gold or SLV has been constructed. Yeah, for yeah, you make some really good points. So, um, you know, with all commodities, you have to think about a number of factors whether you can essentially securitize them in some kind of a exchange listed vehicle. And, and, and those really come down to storage costs, which is a big one. Um, uh, shelf life is another big one. And, um, you know, oil is, is a very expensive commodity store, which is why there is no physical oil fund in the world. There are funds that invest in futures contracts. And I think this year there've been a, a number of examples where, there's been a disconnect between the futures price and the, and the spot price, the physical price. If we go back to March of 2020, you may remember that the futures, the oil futures price actually traded negative value because people were paying you to take it off their hands because they didn't want to pay for storage. So for those reasons at Sprott, we've never been, we've never been proponents of paper-based or futures-based or derivatives-based offerings. Uh, all the funds we run are 100% physically backed because you don't have to deal with any of those those different issues, whether they're contango or different uh, dis, you know, dislocations between the, the, the physical markets and the paper markets. Yep. So we're big believers in physical. That's what we do. Um, that way you mit mitigate your risks. Uh, and you, you know, it's the best way to own, own something that's real. Mm -hmm. And would there ever be any interest in, over I know you mentioned that the cost of storing oil is super expensive, but, you know, considering that uranium is also a very tricky material to handle on a physical basis, um, you know, would there ever be any interest from Sprott to open some sort of an oil trust or sort of a physical oil investment? Because one, you know, it would solve, so for example, if an RIA in the United States wanted to own gold, you know, typically um, owning futures is beyond their mandate uh, and same with retail investors. Um, and so, you know, typically they resort to owning something like GLD. And so, you know, my 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 view or my thinking was that there's a, there's definitely some sort of market out there for, um, you know, a good oil product. But, you know, as you mentioned, when it could go negative into, you know, some of the storage costs are high, but just generally curious. Well, if I if I if I had figured it out, I would have created it by now <laughs> um, because I'm I'm interested in just about every commodity under the sun. Um, whether there's an investment, a compelling investment case for them, whether there's a, a gap in the market in terms of something that's very hard to access or not tax efficient to access, there's all kinds of issues around, um, you know, how do you, how do you bring compelling shareholder friendly products to market? And uh, so at Sprott, we we don't ever stop thinking about it. Um, and when we think we've got something that we would put our own capital in. And and in, a, in a, an investment area that we think has very uh, constructive fundamentals, it's, it's something that uh, we will consider for sure. Awesome, fantastic. Now, John, uh, you know, thank you so much for being on the podcast. You know, before I let you go, do you have any closing thoughts or closing remarks that you know you wanted to share? Uh, no, we covered a lot of ground, and uh, once again, I applaud you for doing this. I think it's great as a young person building their knowledge base. Uh, my daughter also goes to U of T. Lots of really smart kids there. So keep up the good work. Awesome. Thank you so much, John. Good talking to you.